Assalamu alaikum. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, on behalf of uh, University uh, Muhammad V in Rabat, on behalf of NCS, Rabat IT Center, Admir Laboratory, uh, Al Qalsadi uh, Research Team on Digital Innovation. So I'm very proud and delighted this afternoon to introduce Professor Boualem Ben Atlah, who is Science Professor in University of New South Wales, Sydney, Australia. So Professor Boualem Ben Atlah is uh, very active in uh, scientific boards and steering committees of several international prestigious journals and conferences. He had publi published uh, many books. He has uh, influential uh, journal and conference papers. He is also active in collaborations with several governments, uh, international universities, and companies. He will give a keynote uh, in entitled Cognitive Services and Conversational Artificial Intelligence on the integration aspects, so please make noise for him. <laughs> By the way, he was my boss 16 years ago when I was in Australia, so I'm very, very happy to welcome him for the first time in NCS and University Mohammed V in Rabat. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, 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 merci. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation, and I'm um, very glad to, to be here and uh, talk about uh, some research projects, and uh, I hope that you will uh, enjoy. So my talk will be about uh, a concept that I will call uh, cognitive services. Can you hear me there? Yeah? yeah. Okay, so... Um, in two terms, uh, what I mean by cognitive services, but it will be more clear as, as I go, because I will give examples, is kind of uh, software services, but slowly we will turn them to be like uh, human, in the sense that instead of uh, using uh, uh, graphical user interface or command line or APIs, we will talk with them, we will write to them, we will communicate with them in, in natural language. So that is uh, the, the idea behind. In second part of my talk, I will talk about, okay, what does it mean in software uh, architecture and how we are going to build uh, this uh, uh, cognitive services. And after that, I will speculate about certain open uh, uh, and challenging uh, direct, uh, research issue and some directions that we are working on. Okay, so um, probably all of us uh, know that these days, you know, we can already, there is the foundation to communicate with software using natural language. Okay, so that's, that's a start. Um, and then the objective uh, will not stop there, meaning that it's not, at the moment, it's the first generation of this kind of service. Probably if you talk with them in uh, using your mobile phone, things like that, you will be frustrated because they're still uh, not, not mature enough like, like you are talking to a human. But we want, uh, basically in the future, to be able to talk to software uh, like and the software will be behaving a little bit like a human. And without going into much details, I'll, I'll, you will see it through examples and what I mean. You see the, 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 the techno technological foundation already started to be there. You hear about Apple series, you hear about uh, Microsoft Cortana, you hear about Google Assistant, you hear about Amazon Alexa. These are all platforms basically for developing um, this kind of software. So why now? Why uh, 
Now we talk about uh, cognition and cognitive services. I think the drivers is that um, the drivers is that we have the software that we have is allowing us to trace and generate a lot of data. And that will allow us to train uh, models so that the software will learn from the data and like what a human learn from life, you know, like as a human, we go through an experience and we learn from life because we have seen a lot of uh, examples and things like that. And the software will mimic that because we have the data. We also have the processing power um, to, to generate these models and we are all uh, uh, addicted and accessing services via our devices. Um, today with mobiles is very clear, but tomorrow it will be also with IoT and, and things like that. And we have the algorithms behind, you know, the, we have the yeah, artificial intelligence. So one consequence of that is that one think about all these drivers, we will, uh, we are in, in a situation where we can really talk about automation, meaning that some processes that we use to perform uh, manually or semi-manually, we will automatically uh, process. Um, although there are a lot of benefits, for example, uh, maybe, maybe we will be uh, one benefit, maybe we will be more happier as society, more healthier, things like that. But there are two, uh, two uh, metrics that I will use in my talk so that we are a little bit more concrete. There will be something I will call productivity and something called uh, effectiveness. Um, when I say productivity, this kind of software will allow us to do the same thing we used to do before, but faster. Okay, something I used to do in a month, I would be able to do in one day, for example. Okay, so that's what productivity means. Effectiveness, we will do things, the same, the same thing we were doing before, but smarter, more effective, you know, more... Uh, uh, and the example here is that if I am a researcher, um, maybe in the past, because I used to find all the paper related to my research topic manually, going through all the journals, all the... Uh, uh, conferences, things like that, and maybe if there is a very smart uh, software, it will help me find all the research that is related to my research question, okay, so I don't miss anything, okay. The example I give is the example of, uh, of uh, criminal investigation, okay, so if you have, um, and this is uh, kind of real stories, but I'm not going to be very specific, um, there are um, some investigations that go, like, they collect so many information, okay, so, and they can only process uh, enough information during, let's say, three years or something like that, because the, the, the information, although collected through IT, was processed by human, okay, so they missed some some important crimes, for example. There were crimes that they could not identify because there are so many, so many things to go through. Okay. But if we have the processing power, we have the intelligence, we have the... So maybe we will not miss these things that we missed because it's processed by software, not by human. Okay. So we, I will call this process uh, in, 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 in the remaining of my talk the process of cognitive augmentation. What I mean by that, the whole thing is that as a human, it is now time that we are using uh, software to augment ourselves in the sense that we are giving ourselves a little bit of more brain, a little bit of more muscle, a little bit more time, things like that. So that is basically augmenting our cognition using software. For example, I will have a lot of uh, assistants. They will not be human. My assistant for traveling, my assistant for finding my research paper, my, they will be software. I will talk to them, you know, Alexa, can you give me uh, the latest papers in the VLDB conference that talk about cognitive services, things like that. So this is uh, 
So we we'll call this uh, process the process of uh, cognitive augmentation. So what does it mean, uh, how, how we do cognitive augmentation? Well, I will take it, um, before I go far, in fact, what we do in life using software, uh, we do three things. Okay, so one thing, we access content, like we all have files in Dropbox and Word and things like that, this, this or PDF, YouTube, whatever. Um, we also do tasks, you know, we perform tasks, for example, I book a uh, flight, I uh, pay my invoice, things like that, but also we collaborate, okay, so these are three things, tasking, content, collaboration. We want to see what does it mean augmenting this kind of tasks, okay, so what does it mean? So I, I start with content, let's say I have this uh, email. This is an email that say after receiving this email, Johnson spoke to Peterson by telephone on the same day. This is an email written in natural language. Um, in order to be able to do what I want to do, I want to talk to my email. I want to say things like, when did Johnson speak to Peterson? And I want the system to answer on 13 of July by just by accessing that. So to do that, we need to do a lot of things in the middle, meaning that we need to take the, uh, for example, what I do here, we take the raw content, we generate keywords, we generate entities, we generate part of speech, we generate engrams, things like that, to be able to generate a machine learning model. Here I call it word embeddings. Um, uh, and for example, here I'm using so many emails like this to train a model to recognize what is a phone call. Okay, I have a model that when you see an email, it tells me this email is about a phone call, or this email is about a bank transaction, or this email, so that is what is called a vector. I have a vector, you can think of it, if you are not familiar with vectorization, you can think of it as, as a machine learning model. You give it an email, it tells you this is uh, a phone call or something like that. Once we know it's a phone call, we know, for example, that the phone call has a, a, a recipient, has the caller, has the time. Okay, so we use, for example, entity extraction techniques to, to extract the entities from that call. And I will be able, once I have this information, I know it's a phone call, things like that, I will be able to talk to my email system, like, for example, say, uh, when did Johnson speak to Peterson? This is uh, what we call user utterance, user expression. I will be able to know that the user intent is that they're looking for a phone call from this. So because I will build a vector from keywords and things like that, and I find the most closest vector in my space is a phone call. Once I know that, um, I identify the intent, and then the intent tell me that, well, this intent has the, the, the sender, the receiver, and the time. So it will extract this using entity extraction techniques. And then it will be able to uh, generate an object, and from that object generate a natural language uh, expression that the user can understand. Like, for example, it will answer me on 13th of January 2017. So that is how in general, we do what we call machine reading, in the sense that I take a text, things like that, uh, the machine read it and extract uh, whatever I want from it, entities, events, uh, people, things like that. And then once we do that, okay, so we will be able to talk to it also in natural language. Another type of augmentation is augmenting services, or, or at least tasks. So these days, we all use uh, messaging services like uh, uh, Facebook, like Twitter, like uh, Slack, things like that. And the example here is Slack. Okay, so for example, uh, in this communication, you see at certain point, uh, I say I want to book uh, a ticket to fly from this to this. So that's what we do today. Like for example, you send to your uh, school manager or whatever saying I want to travel from this to this and you in general a human 
will say, okay, so the, the, um, when are you traveling? For example, what is the date or what is the city, whatever things like. That. And once it has all the information, meaning that what what a human being do these days, they go to so many other applications to fulfill this request. They go to, for example, the travel agent form. They send an email to the travel agent. They might go to an approval, school approval form, things like that. So they are doing this kind of manually. But imagine, imagine that uh, we have software that understand this and extract the information and communicate directly with those systems. Okay, so meaning that that is what we call augmentation for, uh, meaning I take an application and I augmented the same way I augmented the document and the application understand how to answer natural language queries and things like that. So, but we will go to this, uh, these are just examples. We'll go to the architectural aspect later. So you can see, um, you know, the, the, what we mean by cognitive, uh, of, you know, it can be just extracting uh, entities like annotation, codes, things like that from document. It can be extracting context. For example, time, uh, I look at your calendar, I, I recognize that you have a meeting in two hours. I will send from this, I will trigger a workflow that send you a reminder, but also maybe collect information about the people you are meeting with, uh, the document that you need from your meeting and things like that. And this all from, uh, well, and so we are really, um, augmenting processes basically and the end result will be natural language conversations uh, with services including content services task management services as well as collaboration services so in terms of architecture um, you can think of it like this the, the bottom layer like here the, the yellow one is the systems the IT that we have today you know, we have databases, we have applications, we have uh, workflow management system, things like that. And in general, all these are meant that they interact with a human through uh, computing interfaces, like for example, form, web form, or an app, or a command line, or, so it's really, uh, these are the kind of interfaces. But what we want to do, we want to keep going that, but through, instead of communicating uh, through the traditional interface, we want to communicate using a natural interface, because you know, we want to talk, uh, feel that we are talking to human, not to software. We want to say by voice, by writing a natural language email. And in the future also, like for example, Facebook is working on technology where they even want to use sensors, things like that, to, to be able to understand your intention, even if you cannot talk. Uh, for example, imagine somebody disabled, okay, so you, you can, they can give some sign, or they can uh, think about it in their brain, and things like that. Can we detect what they want? Can we detect their intention and, and trigger the application that fulfills the, the, the so to be able to do that, basically the middle layer is what I call here the cognitive augmentation enablers. Okay, what they will be? In general, they will be uh, models, like in terms of uh, that, that, that learn how to recognize the user intent and, and map it to software. Okay, map it to an API call, map it to an application form, map it to whatever to execute the, the, the application and get back to us. So this will be enabled by a number of technology. I would just say, uh, to simplify, there will be collaboration between human and uh, artificial intelligence because he, uh, artificial intelligence use human to train it and things like that. So. Um, just an example of this, uh, for example, we implemented this uh, ourselves in the context of uh, investigations. You can think of investigation as uh, you are a journalist, you are a researcher, 
you are a lawyer and you are investigating a crime or something like that. In general, what you get in an investigation, you get a huge amount of data uh, before. Uh, and uh, the data can be email, files, videos, uh, things like that. So this kind of software will allow you, for, if we have this kind of software, it will allow you to extract uh, events from this data, offenses from this data, it will, entities, people, and things like that. But, um, and then there will be a model in the middle to allow us to communicate with this data using natural language search and maybe even hypothesis testing. For example, I just collect a number of data and say, can you tell me if Karim Baina traveled between this date to these days from, uh, uh, you know, from uh, Rabat to, to Sydney, or something like that. That's a hypothesis I have. I don't know. But the data should tell me. Okay. That's not a SQL query. It's more, it's more uh, complex than this. So when you see the market, um, we have already a lot of these things. We are, we are first generation, but for example, we have what we call digital assistance for analyzing social media. You know, the journalists, they're not going to social media one post by one post every day. You know, they use software to find tweets that are relevant to the story they are writing, the Facebook posts that are things like that. Marketing people, um, so we are all using these this, uh, services, but to some extent, we are augmenting ourselves. I like these two quotes, um, so bring them here. Like the first quote say, you will be paid in the future based on how well you work with robots. Employee would like you to know how to use robots, you know, like to, to be efficient, basically. The second one is basically predicting that what, what we hear about the AI revolution today, it will not be about algorithms anymore. It will be about what we call augmenting introspection, meaning that how we are using AI to improve uh, the processes that we use uh, uh, every day. So that will be the Next, um, and there is already some work, like for example, this is work done uh, a few years ago by KPMG about what's called uh, robotic software uh, robots e evolution. So they classify this technology in three classes. The first class is called basic process automation, meaning that this is what we have today. If you look at any organization, bank, government, whatever, when they tell you, they are automating processes, for example, automating uh, some citizen, for example, uh, having a driver license, whatever, you know, these are the steps, and they are automating that. What it means, it means that there is a human designer who understands all the steps, you know, so he is really a domain expert, and they understand the process, they draw it using process tool, meaning that in this process we have this activity, this activity and this activity, this one is after this, and things like that. Once they know this and standing, um, they give it to a developer, and the developer will know what are the services to use, what are the databases to use, things like that, what are the interface to use, and they deliver the process to you. So that is the automation as we know it today. It's called process automation. We started seeing an augmentation uh, of this already, which is co which, uh, called enhanced process automation. What it means, you know, these days if you call uh, your train, uh, your uh, travel uh, airline, or hospital, whatever, most likely in the beginning you, you, they give you software to talk to. Okay, meaning that they collected data, they process it, and um, it's still a uh, kind of information retrieval style in the sense that they recognize your question and basically they have an answer for that question in their database. So they give you that answer. Okay. Sometimes, most of the time they tell you, I don't understand. Okay. So, so but that, that's another uh, story. So that is still, uh, this is basically using data, using AI to augment uh, processes uh, even if they are uh, automated. The third, uh, the one that I will talk about in my uh, 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 remaining of my talk is called, called
cognitive autonomic, meaning that we want to go far. In the sense, we want to basically build software that has some almost uh, human characteristics. It works like with you as a collaborator in some task, you think that they are human. Okay, so they are really helping you as a human. So, uh, here we need to use sophisticated natural language processing technology, sophisticated uh, AI, reco uh, IoT recognition software, even recognizing emotion, even recognizing uh, some people are unhappy about the response, like what a human is able to do. Okay, so that we don't have it yet. Um, but that is the objective of the most player in, in the IT space uh, at this stage. Okay, so just to come back to this notion of productivity and, if, uh, and effectiveness, when I say productive, in fact, everything that is repetitive, meaning that, you know, we do it all the time, you know, we fill forms all the time, okay, but it's time consuming, you know, it takes time to fill the, the same, same thing. So that is a target for automation. We can automate these kind of things. We can automate, as I said, rule-based workflow and so on. We can automate a lot of things that are like this. So that is, we, we are using this kind of technology to be more productive. But effectiveness, ultimately, it will be able to, to, be, to, to think about the human brain and think about how the human brain is really, uh, it, it really does to work, for example, well, we do a lot of information analysis. Okay, so as a human, you know, we are able to analyze a document and extract facts from it. You know, for example, extract entities, uh, relationship, intentions, things like that. Um, yeah, the, 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 the objective is that, okay, so if we master this, we will accelerate discovery. For example, we will do research faster. We will do re the discoveries faster, whether we are a journalist, whether we are a YouTuber, uh, 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 broadcaster, or whatever. So we will be able to really process raw information and structured information and make decision, make uh, finding, make uh, faster. That, that will be great. OK, now. We come back to what this, how is this, in terms, you know, most of you probably are software engineers, right? Okay. Yeah, or yes. more, yeah? So, so when, when these days when we use, when we want to build what we call a boat or a digital assistant or whatever, the process is almost like this. What we want is that we have IT system. Let's say this IT system are all, uh, exposed as APIs, okay, so, but, but it can be more than that. There can be apps, it can be, um, yeah, it can be mobile apps or web application, or, but let, let me, uh, just API make me uh, explain the, the abstraction, you know. In fact, all these systems, they have the concept of intent, user intent. So they have a database. We used in the past, we have a database of APIs. We call API repository, whatever. This system, they all have repository of intents. These are things that programmers add every day. You know, if you take Amazon Alexa, he has so many thousands and thousands of intents, the user intent, for example, flight list, uh, finding a restaurant, any intent that you know, you think is usable, you, we add it. An intent has in general a meaning or a definition, what it is, and uh, uh, attribute or parameter, some people call them slots, meaning that what is the information that the machine need to know to fulfill that intent. For example, if it's a travel intent, if you want me, if you want the machine to understand you and uh, book travel for you, you need to give them the destination, the departure, and the date, and you know, like when you are leaving, when you are going, coming back. So these are the parameters or the value. But then we have the human. The human will use natural language. Here I use text, but the human can use uh, also, um, you know, voice, other things. So the human will say things like, show me the list of flights from Sydney to Paris on November 26 and return flight on this. So the software 
has the intelligence or the model to understand that this expression, we call user utterance, user expression, is a flight list intent, meaning that you know the user wants you to list the flight uh, that are available for that date for them. So once we confirm that this is the intent um, that we want, the system will go uh, ahead and there is a program in the middle in general written by programmers, I will explain later, that will translate this intention to an API call. I call the API and book, uh, provide you with the list of the uh, flights. Okay, so in terms of software architecture, again, uh, all this system, um, they have these components. There is a component that allow you to, to communicate using natural language. It can be voice, it can be... There is a component called, uh, some people call it uh, intent recognizers, but it's really about what's called natural language understanding. Okay? Every company, big companies, they have already uh, components that, that do that. For example, Dialogflow from uh, Google, Louis from Microsoft, with .ei from uh, Facebook, they all have this kind of software. Okay. In general, what this does, it takes an expression in natural language and it generates an object called intent. You know, you say JSON object or XML object, whatever. Um, this object is taken and it's given to another component called conversation manager. This is like a, a workflow engine, but for this kind of things. What the conversation manager does, it look at the intent, and it communicate, it, it manage communication between user and APIs, software, things like that, to fulfill this intent. Okay, so it's kind of state machine. We'll give examples later. For example, what this, 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 this does so many things, but I'll just say what it does. For example, when it gets an intent, it may recognize that yeah, this is a, uh, a travel intent, but I'm missing the destination. I don't know when is your destination. So it will ask the user to give the de destination. When are, where are you going? Before communicating with the API. When it has, once it, it has all the information, meaning that the end state, so it communicates with the API and gets you the information. Once it gets you this information, <coughs> Um, there is another component called natural language generation, which take that and uh, which is uh, in general, you know, a program or an API returns JSON object or something like that. That's the user, n n normal user cannot understand. So we need to translate it using uh, also natural language technology. So that's in terms of architecture, okay? So um, in the project, that I'm working with, we are making, uh, uh, we, we looked at this technology, how it is built, who is in the, in the, in the, in the, in the domain, things like that, and from software engineering perspective. We found out that there are a lot of, I mean, that uh, things that can be improved to build these kind of things and, 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 and properly uh, in a more scalable way and things like that. Um, so we call it the scale hypothesis. Scale hypothesis meaning that how we are going to scale the development of this streamlining, for example, what Workflow did for workflow management system did for building business processes. Okay, before business process was in your head and then you go and you program it. But then there was a whole technology that was introduced to simplify defining the business process, executing it, things like that, and so on. So we're trying to repeat the same thing, but for this kind of technology. Why we, th so what, what is this? The hypothesis that we have is that, in fact, this is even true today, but it's a prediction, everything will be accessible through APIs. There is no one thing that will not be accessible. For. This computer will be accessible. This mobile phone will be. Um, this building will be. You know, I can use APIs to communicate with this, uh, the apps and things like that. So if we have that and use APIs as intents instead of uh, creating intents from scratch and so on, API will become intents. That is the intention. Google search API is the intention. Amazon API is an intention. Uh, travel API is an intention, things like. 
So then we can also leverage a bigger technology that's mature, which is called program synthesis or composition, you know, to compose instead of, because the way I showed in the previous architecture, whenever you build a digital assistant, basically you build it from scratch. You, you, you don't divide the intents you want and you program the connection to the API. Um, yeah, that, that's not scalable. We need to be able to, I have an intent, but I don't, uh, by, there is nothing that's implemented in it in the system already, but there may be three other things that I can combine and build it. So that is what I mean, program synthesis and API synthesis to build that. So if you can see, we have content that's accessible through API, you know, resources like uh, cloud resources, uh, human resources, devices and assets, and also everything is accessible through API. So that's why we, we and in general, everything, much of the information we receive about the world is really API regulated, meaning uh, it goes through API, okay? So talking to Facebook, talking to, to Twitter, everything. More than that, um, you are, you know, uh, people are doing programming these days. You can see there is a shift. There is a difference between the way we used to do programming uh, they, they kind of, we don't recognize it, but there are two types of programmers today. They are programmers of the back end, meaning that these are just preparing APIs for the rest of... Uh, and there are people who are building apps, you know, you have an idea, you have an app. So you build, basically what you build, you build the interface. You don't build really the, the back end. The back end is actually, the database is accessible through an API. The, uh, 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 Facebook, uh, you want to store information in Dropbox, you know, so it's all accessible through API. So that is, uh, in fact, I mean, that uh, Donald Ferguson said that a long time ago when we started the, the service-oriented computing uh, paradigm, we're saying that he predicted that end user will provide the applications. Okay, meaning that the people who have an idea that we, and we, we as uh, people creating software technology, we will provide the feed, the data, and the collaborative APIs. We will not be building uh, applications. And, and that's already the case today. But we have challenge. We want to integrate natural language uh, technology with APIs, okay? So the challenge are that, in fact, when we designed APIs, we designed them to be accessible by programmers. We didn't, never thought that APIs uh, or code we will, will be understood by the general uh, human, human natural. So, so that is one problem is that the design that was done before, it didn't predict that we wanted to, to talk to a software. In, in, in a, so that is just a, just a fact. So we, have, we end up having low-level descriptions that are only understandable by, uh, by, by programmers. But on the other hand, when you talk about intents, these are meant to be uh, understandable by human. Okay, so the user utterances are used in natural language and they're fuzzy. What is, does it mean fuzzy? The same thing uh, that I say, you will say it in different way. And as a human, will understand that. You know, like yeah, there is jargon, there is uh, um, all different ways that, you know, we, we're not precise. But if you talk to an API and you miss one parameter or you miss one word in, in the command, you are going to get a return answer I cannot answer. So that is the major problem. So the problem can be summarized is that, in fact, we are doing programming in two different worlds. Uh, the traditional programming world, which is deterministic programming, like meaning that we tell the machine, do that, we have to be precise in telling it how to do it. We need to use a programming language or a command line. Like we need to respect the syntax to, to the point. But on the other hand, for intent, we are in fact doing some probabilistic programming, meaning that, yeah, I mean that, uh, the same intent, we can express it in so many different ways. Okay, so meaning that we don't have a, the, the uh, uh, and it comes from the characteristic of the natural language. The natural language is much rich language than the machine language. Okay, so you can just see it this way. 
Um, this, so coming uh, from this, if we take this API, but this apply to any uh, code abstraction, we do not have the, when you look at definition, uh, how we, we define APIs, uh, API definition model, things like that, we don't have the latent, uh, what I call the latent uh, knowledge that is needed to communicate like uh, in natural language. Okay, so I'll give some, some examples, meaning that we don't yet have the definition in the APIs that are rich enough that will allow us to communicate with an API using natural language. We need to add something else that's missing. The other thing is that uh, hu uh, uh, human intent in general, they are complex. You know, like, uh, for example, let's say I have smart home, you know, um, and they have three uh, IoT APIs. One is to shut the uh, light down, one is to shut the t TV down, and maybe other. So I'm not, you know, like, if I want to implement it using today technology, I, I, I want to go to sleep and I want to shut the, the light and I want to shut the TV. So if I want to do that, I would say, shut the light is a command, shut uh, the TV down, things like that. Imagine I have a hundred things, you know, shut, shut, shut. As a human being, I would like to say I'm going to sleep. The software needs to understand that going to sleep meaning to shut the law and it does all these things. I don't need to tell it, do this, do this, do this. It knows that going to sleep is an intent and this intent is executed by a composition of a number of APIs, not only one. So that, these are things that we don't know yet how to do. The other problem is uh, training data, meaning because the, the, the intent recognition are all machine learning models, so we need to have a lot of user utterances, how to train that intent, and we need quality and scale, meaning that a large uh, amount of data, but it's all quality data, not only uh, the amount of data. So let's uh, give some examples. For example, this is uh, the Yelp API, and the uh, endpoints, or the API, uh, is search business, and it has two parameters, one called term, and one called location. In general, to recognize that, I need to train uh, a model uh, saying that all these sentences, in fact, I need thousands of them, not only that. That's how they train this kind of model. I say all these, in fact, they are, they are, they are uh, expression of this uh, API method. For example, is there any Indian eatery in Randwick? And you can see there is always two things. One is in red and one in blue. These are the uh, entities that will allow me to recognize the, the, the parameters. Um, the parameter term, meaning that any uh, value that is in red here, it's an instance of this parameter term. Anything that's in blue, it's a location and things like that. So that's a process called training, meaning that uh, there are, these are sentences and we annotate them with different colors to say these are all sentences that express the search business uh, uh, endpoint, and these are the value for the parameter term, and these are the value for location. So when I receive an expression, I, I kind of have the model that recognizes not only the intent, but also know how to extract the values. Okay, so what we did, um, we started thinking about this kind of things, um, saying that basically we started with, from the ground up, saying that, um, as I started saying, that the API definitions that we have was not designed to talk with human. So if we want API to talk to human, so we need to add what we call latent knowledge about these APIs. Um, so what is this native knowledge? Like, we, we were inspired by, maybe you all know, uh, the concept of where to back, like embeddings, things like that. The idea of where to back is not, uh, is, is very intuitive and very powerful, a simple, powerful intuitive. And then we try to extend it, what does it mean for an API? The guy who did where to back, the whole hypothesis that he has 
is that word is not syntax is meaning you know it depends on the context things like that for example if i take the word the word obama you know it may like if i say obama okay but if i say the american president maybe i'm still talking about obama maybe if i say the husband of uh, Michelle Obama or whatever, I'm still talking about Barack Obama. There, there are many ways that I express the same word, okay? So we, we, we extrapolated this concept to also APIs. For example, when I say um, search business, you know, like Yelp search business, if I want to talk to it in natural language like this, I have to have a many different way of expressing this because that is how human talking they, 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 they are not precise they will not talk uh, syntax they will talk about something you know and then you need to recognize it so what does it mean for example uh, embeddings but for APIs so so that is what this picture is about so we have embeddings for parameters embedding for endpoints embedding for APIs, we started having embeddings for widgets, embedding for design, embedding for people, things like that. And then once you have this kind of embedding, we start to build the middleware uh, software that will allow us, now, you know, you say, you specify your goals. You say, I want to build the software that will recognize this intent and this intent. And then we will find the API for you and, and maybe widgets, maybe things like that. We are also building a conversation manager um, that, that fit in this, uh, but, but I'll go back to this in a little bit more detail. So uh, just to say, what is this embedding? Okay, if you take an API, API always have a definition. For example, open with an API, from its definition, we know it's about weather data, forecasts, and historical data, for example. So that's um, because it's a domain. It's more than endpoints and, and then more endpoints. So we try to build embeddings, like what the people did for words. They built what we call embedding, which is a vector, meaning a vector of other uh, that's constructed from all the, all the words that are similar to this word, or they have been used in this context, and so on. So here, for example, just without complicating, you can think of, I take a definition, I extract some keywords, and then I extend them with synonyms, with uh, other words from word embeddings, things like that, in a way to, to, to have more, uh, more words that will express the, 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 the description of the API. When I take the endpoint, what does it mean? In, in, uh, uh, for example, I have an endpoint called for, uh, weather forecast. What does it mean, the meaning of that? What does it mean, the, the embedding of that? For example, I will extract all the intents, all the verbs, like for example, get weather, show weather, forecast, things like that. And I will give a lot of uh, example of expression that human will, will use to, to, to be able to. So here we are building, for example, what we call phrases embedding or sentence embeddings to be able to, these are vectors. And then uh, you go to the parameters. The parameters are value. For example, I have location. Okay, so let's say, um, uh, I want to build an embedding for location. It's like a word. Uh, for example, location like uh, like New York. I might say any yes, uh, W N Y city that never sleep. The Big Apple. These are all variation of the word New York. So when somebody use any of them in natural language, I will be able to understand they are talking about New York. You know, whenever somebody uses any sentence like this, I would be able to know they are talking about weather forecast. You see, so that is the, the, the whole point here. Okay, so let's to go like how we build these embeddings. Okay, so for example, let's focus on the most simple embedding, which are the parameters embedding. Um, for example, uh, let's say I have the parameter location and the parameter term, and I want to build embeddings for them. Okay, so. I basically start with expression like this. This expression, you might tell me where it comes from. So there are many methods, and uh, if I have time, I talk about this method in the end. 
there are very, for example, sometimes the, you hire expert to, to give you this expression. Sometimes you use crowdsourcing techniques to, to get this expression, but, but with a quality problem. But people started thinking about generating this expression automatically. Like there is a, what we call generative uh, natural language models that, that helps. They are still in the early stage, but... Uh, so when you have these expressions, Okay, I annotate it with the uh, parameter saying this is a uh, location, this is a location, this is a location, this is a term, this is, no, sorry, this is term, this is location, this is location, this is location, and then um, I want to build a vector, so once I have this, this uh, I use also what's called word embedding, for example, the one built using uh, uh, Google News or Wikipedia, or whatever, to get other other terms using basically distance uh, comparison between them, and you can see here for location. So I built a vector for the value Paris, Dijon, Sydney, Opera House, things like that, and I did an aggregation. So all these I know that they are values of location. So I just aggregate all these vectors in one vector, and I build a vector for location. Then after that, when I get an expression, um, I look at that keyword um, and I build a vector for it and I compare it with the vectors that I have in the database and I find that the most closest vector, uh, closest vector is uh, location, for example. So I know that the, that's how entity recognition uh, algorithms work. So, so most of them work like this. The same thing for uh, endpoints, you know, you give sentences, things like that, and basically you have a list of verbs, as I say, they call, you call them intents, and then you build also vectors to, to do that. You do that for the uh, same thing for API descriptions. Okay, so you end up with the traditional uh, knowledge base that we have about APIs, we have their definition and that's it. But now we have their definition, but we also have vectors that will allow us to recognize, to talk with these APIs. Uh, and then now, you know, like if you type Google now, you go to things like where to vec, uh, code to vec, things like that. So people started even, you know, you have your code, uh, you turn it to a vector, and people started using sophisticated things based on that. Because, for example, what, uh, what companies like, uh, I just saw that uh, a few days ago, like Amazon started using these kind of things to build uh, automatic or, so or semi-automatic code reviews. You know, for example, you give the, the system your code, the, co the, the system will look at your code and say, maybe your code is vulnerable to SQL injections. How they did that, that, because they built a vector for that portion of the code and the vector for uh, the vulnerability called SQL injection and the vectors are, are very close. So they can tell you um, this code, we think it's about, uh, it's about accessing a database and it is linked to uh, SQL injection, and here are the things that programmers, professional programmers, do to fix SQL injection. So, you know, with this kind of simple concept, we can automate a lot of things. Or, another thing, like if you have a big company and you want to even allocate um, uh, people to review that, like, uh, for example, imagine that I read the code and I tell you, in the company, this guy is specialist in, in this. Well, how I did that? I build a vector for the person, I build a vector for the code, and I compare them. Okay, so uh, this, for example, if you are doing research, you know, that's what we were, uh, research, you know, you have, uh, uh, I read your introduction, uh, I read your research question, and I have a database of people from ResearchGate, and I tell you this researcher, this researcher, this researcher are really doing research on this research question. Okay, so, so these kind of things uh, are simple, but they have... Um, but, yeah, we cannot do complex things at the moment. For example, so the things that are what I call direction, and we started working on... Um, in general way, I want to have an intent, for example, the travel intent. Okay, so there will be no one API that satisfies that. For example, there are many. I, but I need to choose one. 
So how to choose? You know, so this happens a lot in e-commerce. Uh, for example, you want to buy, uh, uh, you want to go to a restaurant. Let's say that is the, uh, the example that that's good to use. So I say I want to go to, uh, you know, uh, a Morocco restaurant in, let's say, this uh, city, or whatever. But I want uh, a restaurant that's quiet. I don't like noise. Okay. So, in fact, all the intents that we have in the platform, it tells you what is the intent and what are the parameters that, you know, for example, what is the time, what is the location, what is that. But quiet is just um, a human uh, subjective thing, meaning that. But when you think about how we make decision in life, you know, we make them on subjective attributes. Like, for example, uh, we always rank uh, uh, a restaurant, say it's expensive, uh, it's moderate, it's cheap restaurant, something like that. So we, we, we um, uh, what is quite, quite noisy, things like that. So what we are thinking, we are thinking that we can formalize this as a kind of what is called in fuzzy logic, linguistic variables, meaning that these are variables that are categorical, they have, Let's say the restaurant style has three styles, quiet, uh, noisy, and, and how I recognize, for example, this restaurant is noisy or it is quiet. So I need training data, and probably the training data is the reviews that the, the people give. And, and from the sentences, for example, I find one sentence that people, what somebody wrote, say, oh, people talk a lot in that, uh, or the sound is so high. Or so, so these are examples that I would consider not quite, it's noisy. Okay, so it's training data for noisy. So, so probably we will do similar things that we have done in web service composition when, when we have one request and we have different services to choose uh, among, we use quality of service attributes to, cho to choose. We have a number of, so here is the same, meaning that how can we recognize the quality of attribute, uh, the quality of service attribute from the user utterance? You know, like how to train the system to, to recognize, for example, yeah, the user is looking for a restaurant, but they're looking for cheap restaurant, they're looking for quiet restaurant, they're looking for this and things like that. So that is one problem that I think uh, it's, it's very difficult to use. And so, um, the other is, as I said before, you know. Uh, uh, human intent is always complex. So how to be able from one uh, utterance to decompose it into a whole program, meaning that, uh, that composition. Um, now I talk about the conversation engine. In general, you know, it's not just, uh, th there are a lot of uh, systems that are implemented that we call Q&A, meaning that you ask question, they give you an answer. We call them one single term uh, communication. But a normal uh, conversation is multi term. It's like this. Um, for example, I say hello there, I say hi. The system recognizes that I am, I, this is a greeting intent. So for the greeting intent, the system says we should not invoke an API, just say hello there. I mean, that, that's uh, simple. And then I say, I'm looking for a restaurant. So the system, this is the conversation manager, like a workflow manager. Recognize that this is about uh, booking a restaurant, but it also recognizes that the location is missing and it asks you, where are you? And you give, I say, I am near Opera House, and then it recognized now it has all the parameter, it invoke Yelp and give you the answer. Okay, so that's a multi-term conversation. That's what we. That's what the conversation manager does. It it receives utterances, it processes them, it either communicate with the user or communicate with other services to resolve the. the um, but it is complex issue. Most of the conversation manager we have today, that's why when you call, uh, for example, a digital assistant, most of the time they keep asking you a lot of questions. <laughs> they annoy you, basically, because they're not like a human. They're not powerful. 
Um, what we need to know that in one conversation there will be multiple intent. For example, I, I greet you and then I tell you, help me book my travel, but I can switch to another completely another topic as a human. I talk with politics, you know, I tell you how is the politics about uh, education, things like that. So we should be able to understand that. Uh, um, we also need to manage nesting and composition. What do I mean by that? You know, you see, as a human, we are sophisticated. For example, I tell you, can you book uh, a, a restaurant where we will eat uh, together? But I, I say, and, and, and you ha answer, you say, what date? I say, yeah, date is your birthday. So we need to know, we need to access another, that's nesting, we need to, in the same request, I need to access another service to get me your birthday, for example, from your, from a database or something like that. So, and most importantly, the context. As a human, we really use the context very well, meaning that as a human, I, if, I, if I don't find a parameter of the intent that I need, um, the first thing I look at is, do I have in my memory, for example, do I know this people? Because I don't just ask you, you know, like I don't have it, give to me. So the me a measure for the success of these systems is to ask the user as much question, as, as, uh, uh, as less question as possible. You know? For example, just to give example of context. For example, you ask me about uh, where are you traveling, but maybe I have told you that yesterday. Okay, so from the conversation itself, you remember. Okay, so, but maybe um, if you are a travel agent, I have, uh, you have my profile, you say every December this guy go to, uh, to, to his home city or something like that. So I can deduce from, your, from the context. So what I mean is that as a human, uh, in fact, we have a, a memory, and on the situation, I understand the context, and I try to see if I can uh, uh, find something similar to that context, and reuse all the information that's related to that. The most important complex problem is what that humans are good at, and IT uh, is still behind, is what we call breakdowns and repairs. Humans are very... Uh, good at understanding breakdown in communication. For example, I understand that what I told you, you don't like. Okay, from your face, from the way you talk, from the way... So, repair, I might give you an alternative, thinking that you, you like this instead of this. Okay. Uh, but software is not like this. Uh, well, for example, I understand from your face that you are angry, or you are happy, or you are, and I, I do a repair based on that, things like that. So how to recognize breakdowns that you have to formalize? In linguistic theory, like for example, they have this. They studied this problem for a long time. They have what they call formalized, what's called breakdowns, and in general what humans do to do a repair and things like that. For example, providing missing information is a repair. Uh, is identified that uh, is rejecting an offer, correcting information. These are all repair techniques that humans uh, use. Can we recognize those things automatically using models and build system that will talk like a human, identify repairs like a human and so on? How much time I have? Okay, so the last part is, so I talked about a uh, little bit um, architecture, um, some examples. So the, 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 the last part of this, to build all these uh, embedding models that recognize, basically, we need to, to use, to, to train. You know. So training process is, is kind of standard. In general, we start with an intent. For example, I say I have an intent called create a directory, or, or this is a, an, a, a, let's say this is an API endpoint. And I have the, the parameters, things like that. So I start basically, in general, uh, this can be generated automatically in some systems, but, but let's say the person who provided the intent, I ask them just for one sentence called canonical sentence, like, meaning that and after that, I want to generate many uh, alternative, equivalent alternative to this. Uh, the process is called paraphrasing, meaning that the same phrase, if 
phrase it another way, phrase it another way, phrase it another way. So this can be done by machine, but it also can be done by crowdsourcing. It can be done by experts. So, so this, uh, that's the process. And from these examples, I build the model. Um, so the pro the, as I said before, um, the method to gather this information, it's a field by itself. So, so um, in traditional machine learning, because you know, machine learning before was only used by big companies, things like that. So they hire experts. Um, the, the advantage of experts is that they give you they give you quality data because they're by definition they're experts. But um, experts are also expensive. You know, like they, you, know, you cannot have so many training data. For, you know, so. Just to give the uh, an example, this is a quoting for somebody from Google and his talk, uh, where he said, you know, we try to build uh, models for uh, self-driving cars, okay? He said, 10 years ago, we tried this, it failed miserably. Two years ago, we tried, and it was very successful. The only difference was, the difference was not in the algorithm. We used the same algorithms. The difference was the training data. We had more of it, and we have more quality training data. So that's just to show the importance of training data. So the second <coughs> is what we call acquisition via prototype, meaning that you build the prototype uh, agent. It's not the real one. And you give it to some users. And from the use that you see, you build some training data. The third one that is widely used um, is crowdsourcing use crowdsourcing platforms, um, and, but it has problems. And there is automated techniques. So let's look at the... Uh, so there is a recent pa uh, paper that we published in a conference called NACL, which is uh, in the area of natural language. So this is a PhD student doing a PhD on this topic. So what he did, he did crowdsourcing exercise uh, for uh, training APIs. And he analyzed this, the, the, the data for to see what are the quality problems that we have when we use crowds. So he identified the traditional uh, spelling error, linguistic error, but also semantic errors. For example, you know, some people give you completely different things, like uh, the, the, the sentence is, is the alarm working? And the crowdsource person say, is the bell working? Which is completely different. Some people do cheating, that's the problem of, uh, they, they just want to add, specifically it's paying, if it's paying, um, uh, they just copy and paste, things like that, and you know, they may repeat the same uh, utterance, things like that, because they, they're not there to, or they're malicious, they want to train your model to be a bad model. Like this happens when you have competition, like for example, I'm X uh, company, and I know that another company is building a model, and uh, I want their model to be bad. So I hire people, say, participate in the, in the training data and give them bad data, so their model will be, will be bad. It, it happens. So that's cheating. Um, and the other is task misunderstanding. For example, in this study, it was found uh, I mean, that the, pe the people, you give them an utterance, they think that you are asking them for a translate translation. For example, you, you give them an utterance in English, instead of paraphrasing it in English, they give you the, answer, the same thing in Arabic. Uh, so so, that's, so the, 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 this, uh, this is the major problem in crowdsourcing. There are a lot of quality problems. Um, the second thing that we started playing with is a bit uh, kind of high level. And um, what we think is that, you see, when you look at software, an important area of software is quality, meaning that when I deliver software, there is a process to make sure that you are generating quality software. And in, in big company where safety, reliability is important, they will not release the software unless... So one technique that we use in, in quality, there are a lot of techniques, but testing, okay? So, we test the software, we have test cases. But when you look at the testing that's done by programmer, most of us are programmers here. In general, we test for performance. 
Maybe we test for functionality, we test for this. But here it is software that's you know, going to solve uh, human problems, things like that. We need to also test for human values. Is this software ethical? Is this software fair? Is this software diverse? Things like that. You know, diversity is very important. For example, mm, let's say we have uh, regional communities, and let's say they talk their dialect. Okay, they talk their dialect. They don't talk like the uh, big city. Because in general, that's the case. I mean, that I can see from my own village when I live when I live in Algeria. They, you know, in the village, we talk differently than Algiers. Okay, so they have. And if I want to build the software that will answer the citizen questions, you know, and I train the software only for. Uh, 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 with people with accent from Algiers, you know. So, if somebody from my village uh, talk with that software, with that software, they will not understand them because there was no diversity in the training data. So, in this paper, uh, again done by the same PhD student, uh, what we did, we looked at the training data for um, this this kind of cognitive services, and we tried to push. The crowd, we assume that the training data is, uh, is the paraphrasing is done by the crowd, but we try to push the crowd to make sure to provide uh, diverse uh, utterances. Uh, how we did that, um, the concept of diversity is very well known in linguistics. Okay, so they have metrics for it, things like that. So we just reuse their metric to know if the training data that we have so far is diverse or not. Okay, so that's, that's assume that we have this uh, function. But what we did, another thing, is the, um, uh, um, let me look at the right term for this. Yeah, we looked at um, a bias that a human has. Okay, so a human, for example, let's say we have exam uh, uh, one hour later, and I show you certain things, like for example, I show you uh, sentences like string and strong. I show them to you. In fact, this, this technique is, is used in, in marketing a lot. And then in the exam, I show you, I tell you, there is a sentence that starts with uh, ST, feel it. If I show it to you string two hours before, most likely you will say string. You will not say strong, although the answer could be strong as well, things like that. So basically what we do, we kind of leverage this bias that a human has, and we show you the words that are, the words that are in uh, big size are the words that we want you to, to choose. If you choose, you will increase the diversity of the, of, the, of the training data. So we kind of use the human bias in the other way to be positive. In general, human bias used to be negative, things like that. So marketing always shows you certain things to push you to do something they want you to do, to, for example, things like that. So here we are using the same concept and the paper is also accepted in one of the major conferences. It's called Intelligent User Interface uh, 2020. Um, yeah, I can send the paper to anyone who's uh, interested, but the idea is simple. Okay, so we have, uh, uh, we give people a sentence or a paraphrase, and we want them to paraphrase it. Basically, we use. Uh, the database of paraphrases that we have already, we compute uh, the diversity with regard to this, uh, this, this intent. And then we also use, uh, you know, I can read that uh, word embeddings, uh, some techniques called uh, word alignments, things like that. There is a lot of algorithms there. To extract basically a number of keywords um, that we think uh, if we use them, we will increase the, the, the diversity. These keywords, we get them from uh, word embeddings at the moment. Okay, so but we can get them from, if it's software, for example, we may get them from Stack Overflow. If it's, 
social media, maybe we get them from Facebook, things like that. But, but I think that people like this, uh, this uh, contribution. Uh, the third aspect is automatic canonical utterance generation. Again, this is the same thing done by students. Where in general, I mean, that when I have an API and I want to generate the first canonical sentence, in general, we always generate it uh, manually. But in this work, basically, we use kind of uh, grammars and uh, templates and things like that to generate the canonical sentence uh, automatically. And also there are other people, for example, even generating. This is a field uh, that is well developed in the area of uh, language translator, trans translation. For example, if you use Google translators, that's how it works. Okay, so it leverages crowdsourcing and automated generation of, uh, of, of sentences and things like that. So, for example, when you are, when you, when you, when, um, you know, there is one sentence, Google translated for you, in, in some cases, because they have crowd in, in, in the back end. If you correct the sentence, for example, you say, no, it's not like this, it's like this. They use it as a way to correct their model, include their model and things like that. So, in summary, uh, what I tried to say is that, okay, so I started with the concept of augmentation, uh, meaning that augmenting basically processes with robots, uh, software robots that behave like human and they can collaborate with us as an additional, for example, research assistants or teaching assistants. For example, some of them will be, I'm sure that marking, you know, correcting things like that will not be done by human in a few years. I'm 100% sure by that. Um, reviewing papers, some of it is going to be done. Maybe the first review is going to be done by software and the human uh, just complement the software, things like that. Um, the, the, uh, the key technology I mentioned is machine reading, meaning that machine be able to uh, read uh, videos, read uh, natural language, read, and then generate uh, tagging and so on. The most important thing that I talked about that is in general it's not yet in the generic general purpose system, and I tried to show some example of it in API, what basically the people in natural language did for words, you know, to understand words, having models for them. Just think when you say words, just think about the impact of word to vec uh, uh, algorithms, okay? So here we are trying to replicate that, but for structured knowledge, for example, for data type, for APIs, for linguistic variable, for design, for, uh, for example, if I have a design, somebody give me a design, what we are thinking about is that I understand that design and I suggest to you all the widgets that you need to implement that you, you, you design, all the APIs that you can use, all the test cases, things like that. So, so these are the things that we are able to do. We are also looking at the, the conversation manager and how to make it robust, like human understanding, uh, breakdowns, doing repairs, doing composition, and also the training data, as I explained, is very important. And there are two things. We need to find methods to scale the process of training, but to also ensure that there is quality of training. There are a lot of applications that we are working on with collaborators. For example, one was the investigations. Now we are working on similar things for automating some part of the software engineering process. An important, we have one PhD that's working on uh, using the same thing to automate a research uh, process, like specifically we're focused on SLR, uh, what's called systematic literature review that any student do when they are in the early stage of their PhD. So the idea here is that we give, for example, the research questions uh, instead of keywords, and the system will help us find the papers, tag them, with concepts uh, and, and, and so on. We're also looking, working on uh, security reports. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure if you know what is called uh, bug bounty programs. Uh, it is our kind of security company 
give you their software, it give it to software testers, or, and they, they, it ask them to find vulnerabilities. Okay. Once they find vulnerability in general, they have to generate to write a report. Okay, a report and send it to the company that. In general, if, if it's crowdsourced, you have maybe many reports, and the problem is going through the reports one by one and eliminating which one is really correct and true report, which one is false. It's a huge uh, amount of uh, work. So we are using the same technique, basically, to recognize to a certain degree what are the reports that we should just reject because they, they are not the correct report and, and focus only on the report that but also, we are also looking at people uh, management in the sense that for this kind of vulnerability, instead of inviting everybody from LinkedIn, you know, uh, maybe invite only these people because they are expert in, in, in this area. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, that's my talk. Yeah, thank you. So, questions, I guess? Thank you, Professor. I, we have, I think we have time to, to answer one or two questions, or three. The first one is always difficult, so we, we can go to the second one directly. Okay. Professor Moradi. Good evening. I, I have two questions. The first one is related to the languages. What do you speak is about English? Mm -hmm. How is about other languages like Arabic yeah. or French, for example, who there is not a lot of work regarding natural language processing? And the second question is related to the models. You speak about rules models and statistical models. Yeah. What is the best, and what is what is the the largest? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the question. The first um, question. I think that yeah. Although every language has its uh, yeah, its spe specific things like that. For example, I see a lot of work done by Chinese for the Chinese language. I also started seeing some work done by on the Arabic language. French language, in fact, uh, uh, language processing techniques are, are, are very well advanced for French language. So, again, different from one language to the other, I, spo I, I choose the English because I think it's the most simple one. Uh, I mean, that compared to other languages, things like that. So, yeah, I mean, that there is, there is. Uh, and, in fact, even the tools, like what I mentioned, uh, Google, uh, uh, language understanding, uh, Facebook, things like that, they're all extending themselves to other languages than the English. But they all have a platform working perfectly or uh, very well for, for English first. But I see a lot of companies start in, in French. The second thing you mentioned, probabilistic models and uh, rule-based models, okay? In general, um, there is no thing that is best than the other. There is only situation where it is best to use rules or best to use a probabilistic model. So rules in general, if you know the number of ways that people are going to communicate is is known. For example, there is only this three variation whatever. Okay? So it's better that I write a rule, for example, a regular expression that ends that recognize all these uh, different things. But if it is open, okay, rule has its limit. So what people started doing, that they started using rules basically to, I write a rule and I generate uh, the opposite. I gener from the rule I generate some natural language expression and then I move to the probabilistic model to, 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 to have. When it is, uh, as I said, it's complex, I cannot, in fact, rules are only used if you want to do what is called controlled natural language, okay? Uh, but if you really want to use natural language, you have no choice but to use probabilistic model. Um, 
they're fuzzy, they might not recognize always the same intent, uh, the, the intent correctly, uh, the breakdowns, things like that. But if you keep using the system, you keep collecting, uh, you keep correcting mistakes, for example, using uh, reinforcement learning like as Google use for its search engine, things like that, you know, you will end up having good models uh, over, over long term. Of course, you start from uh, simple and maybe not so good models. Another yes. question? Yes. 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 Thanks for, for the great talk, by the way. Uh, I just have like a question or two. So uh, uh, we've, we're, uh, we're talking about how to make these uh, chatbots or virtual assistants more, uh, more human. So how are we treating some, some, uh, uh, some things that exist in the human language? Uh, that uh, maybe these virtual assistants can pick up, like things like uh, uh, hidden meanings or sarcasm or something like that. Maybe humans say stuff and they mean other other stuff that we can't like pick up uh, automatically. And uh, uh, my second question is about um, how do we make these uh, virtual assistants uh, more uh, this conversation with them, more of a two-way conversation than a one-way, uh, where they, they're not just uh, uh, like answering our requests, but uh, also engaging in conversations uh, in a two-way manner. Yeah, That's, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, it's a very uh, good question, but I, I started with saying, um, you know, this problem that you're talking about, that, 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 that is, if today we have solved this problem, then this digital assistant will be like that. But we haven't. Like, for example, you talk about sarcasm and things like that. So this is kind of in linguistic. In linguistic, they call it the speech tag, something like that. You know, like, I can say that you are joking. Or you are and they are, in general, all... Uh, uh, subjective concepts like a human are, are, are good at identifying, but the machine is not. It's like sentiment analysis from social media, you know, how it is used. But I think that with, in our training data, with, in our understanding of the problem, without, without also leveraging what has been done in social science, in linguistic, in brain science, things like that, which will take time, by the way, we will be able to, to at least move there. So, the second question was how to uh, have a true conversation, not only machine-coded conversation, things like that. I think it is a, is, a, is a little bit the same, uh, but at different level. I mean, that this one is at the utterance level, meaning at the semantic level, but the other is at the conversation level. For example, uh, you know, if we have, uh, like, I want to build, for example, I mean, Amazon started a little bit doing that, you know, working with uh, Hollywood and things like that, where it's starting to build uh, software like this that will read uh, stories to children in, in, in the night or whatever, you know. So you need software that kind of uh, is a little bit like human to change topics, to understand uh, what topic to talk about today, things like that. And again, it's it's an, an, another models, but not at the utterance level, meaning not, not at the language level, but at the conversation level, meaning that, okay, so I am talking about this intent. At the moment, uh, all the machines, all the, all the systems are, are developed in a way where the transition from one intent to the other is basically transition from one state machine to another state machine and recognizing that I, I need that one. So what about if uh, uh, we use, for example, things like generative UI to generate the, the, the intent uh, based on, on, 
on the on the discussion that I have now and things like that. There is no software that does this, uh, things like that. But yeah, it is things that we aim to to have, and there is not much understanding of it. There is not much done of it. And my take on this: we need to work with other. We need to work with linguistics. We need to work with uh, cognitive science people. People. They have done a few of these things in, in, in the past. Yeah. Thank you, Professor, for your uh, excellent uh, keynote. I have two questions. If I understood well, uh, the model is uh, language agnostic, since you do not uh, analyze a morphosyntactic uh, aspect of a language, and you are more V v vectorial oriented, so it's kind of back of back of words yeah. model. Yeah. So uh, you, 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 we can extend it to to every language. This is my first question. And the second language, there is a barrier of adoption since uh, the programmer need to describe his API in terms of intents. Is there any work to uh, like infer intents? from comments uh, or, or from the code itself. So it declares that this is looking for, for travel agency, this is looking for restaurant, etc. by uh, done also automatically by AI. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thanks, yeah, these are all valid questions and uh, they are already asked in the, in, the, in the research in this area, for example. The first question, yes, that's true, why, why we prefer vector uh, representation than other representation is to be able to replicate in fact the same techniques not only across languages but also across problems we were able to use this for investigations we were able to use this for uh, code in the, in the security area we were able to use this uh, I mean we, we started using trying to think about this into even design, you know, represent design as, as vectors, okay? So I think that is why I personally uh, believe that, I mean, some people make different arguments that we need to use other traditional machine learning techniques because I'm yet, not, I'm not yet, we are not yet investigating, although the research community is doing, like things like deep learning and so on. Because for me, what matter is, is the foundation, the algorithms. I'm not an expert myself in, in the algorithm. I will reuse them and, and things like that. But the representation, I'm kind of confident because the intuition that matters. And I was really uh, impressed by, by the word of the uh, simplicity, but also it, it was very successful in a lot of natural language processing tasks. Um, and that is, when you understand it, it's very clear because I, I am not talking about, when I tell you, the good example that I use to explain this is uh, querying a database. Uh, so a database in general, to, what we, when we design database, we have database schema. We have the notion of attributes, let's say. Just, when I ask a query, a SQL query, unless I mention that attribute by name, well, I'm not going to get the information, okay? So when people started building natural language processing technique using classification, other model of uh, AI, yeah, no matter what the language, uh, natural language processing technique were powerful, whatever, but if you don't have that attribute spelled by the user, as a, like for example, if the attribute is, is salary or employee, if you don't mention that, you will not get what you want. But if you use vector, the, if there is a table that somebody put X, the attribute is X, but the values are about salaries, things like that, and I build a vector, it will be similar to somebody mentioning salary in the, in the, question, in, in the, in the query, because the vectors are, are, are really the same. Like that. So that is meaning that it's an, uh, it's an abstract representation, it's mathematical representation, and that's the power of that. Um, the second question, sorry, uh, the, I don't have good news. Sorry, but the programmer himself need to describe the API in terms of intents, and we could replace even the developer by the AI agent to infer 
Yeah, this, this uh, although difficult, um, there is, uh, 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 for example, a major uh, project in Stanford that started doing exactly this. Like what it's saying is basically, the premise is that, you know, if we want machine learning to be really, uh, used by the whole society, not only the rich uh, companies, things like that. Uh, we need to automate some of the, even if we generate low level data, things like that, still we need to really automate uh, generating, for example. I don't need uh, somebody to describe their API, okay? So if we learn some uh, definition, uh, like design patterns, for example, okay? So they're building templates, uh, basically where um, you generate some sentences automatically. You, you, you read code from just some comments. Um, for example, you have this function and uh, you look at open source as, as training data. You find this function used in this code, this code, this code, this code, this code, and then you find, you use the, the, the comments. Okay, from that you can generate a description of this and uh, things like that. It's still at very early stage, but in one of the slides I mentioned it, um, some work. Yeah, I mean, that this is a little bit related to that. Um, if you read this paper, um, the related work section explains the state of the art in this. Other questions? Yes. Thank you, sir, for the informative talk. So uh, you've talked the most about uh, machine learning challenges and uh, or technical challenges. What about security challenges? Especially that here we are talking about a system which include many components or subsystems. And uh, are there any works done to, to answer the secu security uh, question? Thank you. Okay. <coughs> So, when you think about security, first, uh, I think there are two levels of uh, security that I can think of, okay? So, one is that, first of all, this is a software as well. So, anything that has to do with software security is, is valid here, okay? But there is a lot of work about that. But the thing that uh, I mentioned a little bit, uh, that we will see, we already know, there will be new type of attacks that has not that cannot be processed using traditional security methods. The, the attack will basically attack the training data. To, to, because given that the model is as good, is only good if the training data is good. Okay, so if you attack the training data, you pollute the training data, things like that, you will, it's kind of security attack. It's, 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 it's in this domain it's called quality, but uh, they're not going to, going to attack you to, to find how to access your software, how to access, they're going to infiltrate your, your uh, training. And, and this happened to even big companies. For example, I give one, one example, okay? So one example is, uh, uh, Microsoft, if you remember, they had a tweet, uh, 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 some software like this that tweet automatically. Okay, so when somebody tweet, they, they so the the software started insulting people, you know, making an insult, you know, like uh, offensive uh, comments, things like that, and they traced that uh, is that traced it to the training data, meaning that there were people who went to pretend they are training, crowdsource uh, training, and they were giving bad uh, words to, to, to. And then the, the, the software just learned from that and they started. So that is kind of a security attack in the sense that ima imagine that we will use software to decide, uh, we are not doing that yet, but imagine, to judge somebody in the court. Okay, like we get the document of this person where uh, all the, and then we say he's criminal. Okay, so, see, and then we tell the judge, the software believe that this guy is criminal. But imagine that the training data, the, the information that we collect is always from social media. I think it has the human bias, for example. And we make important decision about 
data that's not clean, that's not uh, things like that, uh, then the software will be unjust. So we can also think that this is kind of uh, security attack. That's why I mentioned that as software engineers, we need to start thinking about different type of testing for this kind of software. Testing the data that we are using to, to generate the models. I like in this context, I have seen so many works and, and a little bit fuzzy, but one thesis, one PhD thesis, uh, one, 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 it's a paper by a PhD student. I liked very much because what she did, <coughs> she looked at from, from sociology, what we know in social science, what are the human bias that are identified? For example, the gender bias, uh, the Give me another bias. Rice, racial bias, things like that. So these are known in, in the society. There is so she looked at them, and she looked at all the word embeddings, or some of the major word embeddings, including the one by Google, that are used by. Uh, and she found that, surprisingly, they, she looked at the model only first. Surprisingly, they have the same thing as the human bias. Uh, for example, you find that the word nurse is very close to the word woman compared to the word engineer and the word male. That is the gender bias. So, so if you use that in machine learning when there is a job, it's an engineer, I will probably propose, uh, 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 advertise it more to a male. Uh, if it's a nurse, I will advertise it more to females. That's come, that, this is known in, in social, uh, uh, it's known, it's really known what's called uh, bias. So uh, she found it in the models. And then what she did, she also looked at the training data of this model. The training data of this model were newspapers from Google News, Wikipedia entrance, social media posts, things like that. When you think about those, they were all contributed by human. So basically, it's still the human bias. It's also going to the machines. Uh, yeah, I mean, to maybe. Maybe I don't answer exactly your question, but to me, the difference between this type of software and the tradition, we have traditional software, we know security problem in traditional software, we still need to do that, but we need, still need to think about this software, they are built based on data. If we find a way to infiltrate data, either by machine or by human, and corrupt it through either bias or, or other means, then we can. This is major security problem. Yeah. One last question, maybe. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor. That was very interesting. Uh, I only have one question, please. Uh, you had uh, a slide about the knowledge graph, and then uh, the techniques we use today in. In, in the semantic web, the knowledge graph, the linked data concept, how those are related really to this augmented concept? Yeah. Um, you know, when you think about knowledge graph, it's, it's just a concept, okay? So, but the most known knowledge graph is, for example, you can think of uh, Google Knowledge Graph or Wikipedia, things like that. They all have, um, the concept that the, the, there is entities and the relationship between them. Okay, so that's that's. Uh, so here, what we started saying, I mean, that to some extent, that is also building a knowledge graph in the sense that imagine I, I add an intent into the intent database, and this intent has this endpoint, this parameter, that parameter. If I can collect through, from the crowd, like what they do in Wikipedia or from by machine. Um, all the words that I can use for the, uh, uh, the parameter, okay, add them to that graph. All the verbs that I can use for the int intent and things like that. So I end up also with maybe knowledge graph, but for operational knowledge, not for facts and entities, but for code or for um, 
But as I said, you know, you have to go from the, uh, the hypothesis that I had. The hypothesis I had that everything will be APIs. Can we have an API knowledge graph? Meaning that tell us about when I have an API, tell me. Because there are, there are similar APIs. So why I should train uh, the same API from scratch all the time? They're similar. Maybe if I find that they are similar to this, I will reuse their training data and modify things like And that is why I, I use the concept of knowledge graph. Yeah, another question? One very last another question. Uh, thank you for the enlightening talk. Um, just to uh, reiterate for about what you just mentioned about using uh, AI in a legal uh, environment, there was actually a, an experiment done in the US to uh, to use AI in pre uh, preliminary uh, court decisions to see if it could replace uh, potentially the jury system, etc. And what they had found is that uh, uh, the system was given longer sentences for African Americans compared to their Caucasian counterparts, and um, that is, in fact, a reflection of the historical bias in the U.S. Um, but unrelated to that, my question is actually uh, about the. Uh, there is a voice-activated uh, uh, skill in um, Alexa, Amazon Alexa, called uh, Kids MD. Uh, what it does it is it provides uh, pediatric pediatric uh, pediatric treatment um, advice for parents who have uh, younger children. And uh, my question is: there is a trend now um, in improving or, or providing personalized care, ongoing or aftercare, etc., in healthcare environments. My question is um, the adaptability, basically, of the conversational AI into becoming a um, skilled or expert uh, bot in a specific domain, whether it is um, a medical bot or a legal bot, etc. What is the adaptability of this model and um, how can we improve it to provide better or a more uh, personalized uh, bot capable of providing not only medical care in a conversational manner, but also um, uh, give more info, um, give the patients the ability to make more informed decisions, etc. Okay. okay, yeah, thanks for the question. I mean that, uh, uh, again, um, these are very tough uh, issues, not, not, uh, so in one side, a kind of, the potential is there, meaning that we can really improve uh, patients' health, things like that, using conversational systems. So I presented really the positive side in the sense that engineering for the cases where um, these are going to be useful. Okay. But you know, um, there are also a lot of other researchers, not necessarily computer scientists, um, who are looking at this as, uh, okay, so now it is clear that the system will be used, um, things like that. So how to be basically able to design them in a way where we avoid some of the problem that you mentioned, uh, that, you know, that uh, system that we used in the court case, that system that Alexa skill that, that uh, um, so you know there is uh, two techniques in general in, uh, in this kind of thing, in life and there's also in software uh, some area is kind of handled by what's called verification meaning that before I release the software I verify that it's going to respect this property this property this property in traditional software, in general, we express a property uh, using logic. For example, just for the sake of simplicity, a lot of papers were written about uh, termination. I want to verify that the program will terminate at a certain point. But here, for example, uh, I think that people started thinking about, can I express something that the software will not be racist? Okay, so how I form, how, what does it mean? How I formalize it? How I verify it? What? Uh, we don't know. Okay, we don't know. We know that in practice in life, what we have 
We have a court system in the sense that we know these kind of mistakes. Uh, we know that people can make them, okay? So we can prevent, but we cannot prevent people. That's why there are people in jail. Some people steal, some people, you know. And then the court system should... Uh, so I think at certain point, when this is what is uh, advocated by lawyers now, like people in law, they're saying that, yeah, we need to... Um, yeah, and it happens already in the US. You know, we need to punish software, not only human. I mean, that we need to find out, you know, who built the software, who, who made this mistake, and things like that. If it's a company, they need to take responsibility, things like that. In, in general, so, so I think you will see kind of two techniques in general as it, as it happens in life. Preventive techniques, we try to find a way to prevent these things from happening, but that is difficult. Because why is difficult? Because they're abstract concept, you know. Like it's, uh, um, and the other is uh, punish, punish uh, techniques in the sense that people you need to find a punishment way to punish people who build software that violate rules, uh, things like that. But we are not yet there. We're really not there. It's a debate. Um, you find uh, reports written by, you know. Uh, think tanks, things like that, that that's what, what, what research should focus on. But as a researcher, we are still building, you know, the software. We're still looking at what is the software architecture is and things like that. Yeah, but good question, yeah. Yeah, okay. So. I do know that technology influences people. Like, for example, when you see people talking, sometimes I talk with people, young people in Facebook, I don't understand them. They use uh, at this, uh, you know, so certain short things. It's a language they built, you know, like, so, so they don't talk in it in the street when they, you know, when they say, say it to them. But, but they talk on it when they are messaging, okay? So this means that the technology is impacting people, and I think by uh, deduction, I would say that the yeah, Alexa and so on might have the same effect on people. Whether this is good or bad, I really don't know because it has the science has to be done by brain scientists, uh, scientists to see, okay, these kind of things are having an impact on on this phenomena, for example, on human intelligence, things like that. Uh, you know, my hypothesis is, is the opposite. Uh, Humans are becoming smarter and smarter. I mean, uh, you know, like, I mean, yeah, so we are creating things that are. It doesn't mean that we talk this way or that way, <laughs> but, but may, maybe the scientists will prove me wrong. Okay, so thank you. But it's, yeah, it's, it's a valid concern. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation first and then for the answers you gave. Uh, I would, on behalf of Al Khalsadi uh, Resource Team, on behalf of uh, Rabat IT Center, and on behalf of NCS and University uh, Mohammed Sank in Rabat, to thank you very much to have been visiting us. And uh, we would like to see you 
maybe some few years or months, I don't know. Thank you. And, uh, thank, thank you all to having been there. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.